Excerpts Concerning Costermongers from London Labour and the London Poor by Henry Mayhew. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Religion of Costermongers An intelligent and trustworthy man, until very recently actively engaged in costermongering, computed that not three in one hundred costermongers had ever been in the interior of a church, or any place of worship, or knew what was meant by Christianity. The same person gave me the following account, which was confirmed by others. The costers have no religion at all, and very little notion, or none at all, of what religion or a future state is. Of all things they hate tracts. They hate them because the people leaving them never give them anything, and as they can't read the tract, not one in forty, they're vexed to be bothered with it. And really, what is the use of giving people reading before you've taught them to read? Now, they respect the city missionaries because they read to them, and the costers will listen to reading when they don't understand it, and because they visit the sick, and sometimes give oranges and such like to them and the children. I've known a city missionary buy a shilling's worth of oranges of a coster, and give them away to the sick and the children, most of them belonging to the costermongers, down the court, and that made him respected there. I think the city missionaries have done good, but I'm satisfied that if the costers had to profess themselves as some religion tomorrow, they would all become Roman Catholics, every one of them. This is the reason. London costers live very often in the same courts and streets as the poor Irish, and if the Irish are sick, be sure there comes to them the priest, the sisters of charity, they are good women, and some other ladies. Many a man that's not a Catholic has rotted and died without any good person near him. Why, I lived a good while in Lambeth, and there wasn't one coster in one hundred, I'm satisfied, knew so much as the rector's name, though Mr. Dalton's a very good man. But the reason I was telling you of, sir, is that the costers reckon that religion's the best that gives the most in charity, and they think the Catholics do this. I'm not a Catholic myself, but I believe every word of the Bible, and have the greater belief that it's the word of God because it teaches democracy. The Irish in the courts get sadly chaffed by the others about their priests, but they'll die for the priest. Religion is a regular puzzle to the costers. They see people coming out of church and chapel, and as they're mostly well dressed, and there's very few of their own sort among the churchgoers, the costers somehow mix up being religious with being respectable, and so they have a queer sort of feeling about it. It's a mystery to them. It's shocking when you come to think of it. They'll listen to any preacher that goes among them, and then a few will say, I've heard it often, a bloody fool, why don't he let people go to hell their own way? There's another thing that makes the costers think so well of the Catholics. If a Catholic coster, there's only very few of them, is cracked up, penniless, he's often started again, and the others have a notion that it's through some chapel fund. I don't know whether it is so or not, but I know the cracked up men are started again, if they're Catholics. It's still the stranger that the regular costermongers, who are nearly all Londoners, should have such respect for the Roman Catholics, when they have such a hatred of the Irish, whom they look upon as intruders and underminers. "'If a missionary came among us with plenty of money,' said another costermonger, "'he might make us all Christians, or Turks, or anything he liked.' Neither the Latter-day Saints, nor any similar sect, have made converts among the costermongers. Of the uneducated state of costermongers. I have stated elsewhere that only about one in ten of the regular costermongers is able to read. The want of education among both men and women is deplorable, and I tested it in several instances. The following statement, however, from one of the body, is no more to be taken as representing the ignorance of the class generally than are the clear and discriminating accounts I received from intelligent costermongers to be taken as representing the intelligence of the body. The man with whom I conversed, and from whom I received the following statement, seemed about thirty. He was certainly not ill-looking, but with a heavy cast of countenance, his light blue eyes having little expression. His statements, or opinions, I need hardly explain, were given both spontaneously in the course of conversation, and in answer to my questions. I give them almost verbatim, omitting oaths and slang. "'Well, times is bad, sir,' he said. "'But it's a deadish time. I don't do so well at present times as in middleish times, I think. When I served the Prince of Naples not far from here—I presume that he alluded to the Prince of Capua—I did better, and times was better. That was five years ago, but I can't say to a year or two. He was a good customer, and was very fond of peaches. I used to sell them to him at twelve shillings the plasket when they was new.' The plasket held a dozen, and cost me six shillings at Covent Garden. More sometimes, but I didn't charge him more when they did. His footman was a black man, and an ignorant man quite. 
and his housekeeper was an Englishwoman. He was the Prince of Naples, was my customer, but I don't know what he was like, for I never saw him. I've heard that he was the brother of the King of Naples. I can't say where Naples is, but if you was to ask at Euston Square, they'll tell you the fair there and the time to go it in. It may be in France for anything I know, may Naples, or in Ireland. Why don't you ask at the square? I went to Croydon once by rail, and slept all the way without stirring, and so you may to Naples for anything I know. I never heard of the Pope being a neighbour of the King of Naples. Do you mean living next door to him? But I don't know nothing of the King of Naples, only the Prince. I don't know what the Pope is. Is he any trade? It's nothing to me when he's no customer of mine. I have nothing to say about nobody that ain't no customers. My crabs is caught in the sea, in course. I gets them at Billingsgate. I never saw the sea, but it's salt water, I know. I can't say whereabouts it lays. I believe it's in the hands of the Billingsgate salesman. All of it? I've heard of shipwrecks at sea caused by drowning, in course. I never heard that the Prince of Naples was ever at sea. I like to talk about him. He was such a customer when he lived near here. Here he repeated his account of the supply of peaches to His Royal Highness. I never was in France, no, sir, never. I don't know the way. Do you think I could do better there? I never was in the Republic there. What's it like? Bonaparte? Oh, yes, I've heard of him. He was at Waterloo. I didn't know he'd been alive now and in France, as you ask me about him. I don't think you're larking, sir. Did I hear of the French taking possession of Naples and Bonaparte making his brother-in-law king? Well, I didn't, but it may be true, because I served the Prince of Naples what was the brother of the king. I never heard whether the prince was the king's older brother or his younger. I wish he may turn out his older, if there's property coming to him, as the oldest has the first turn. At least so I've heard. First come, first served. I've worked the streets and the courts at all times. I've worked them by moonlight, but you couldn't see the moonlight where it was busy. I can't say how far the moon's off us. It's nothing to me, but I've seen it a good bit higher than St. Paul's. I don't know nothing about the sun. Why do you ask? It must be nearer than the moon, for it's warmer. And if they're both fire, that shows it. It's like the taproom grate, and that bit of a gaslight, to compare the two is. What was St. Paul's that the moon was above? A church, sir, so I've heard. I never was in a church. Oh, yes, I've heard of God. He made heaven and earth. I never heard of his making the sea. That's another thing. And you can best learn about that at Billingsgate. He seemed to think that the sea was an appurtenance of Billingsgate. Jesus Christ? Yes. I've heard of him. Our Redeemer? Well, I only wish I could redeem my Sunday togs from my uncles. Another costermonger, in answer to inquiries, said, I suppose you think us original coves that you ask. We're not like Methuselah or some such swell's name. I presume that Malthus was meant, as wanted to murder children afore they was born, as I once heard lectured about. We're nothing like that. Another, on being questioned, and on being told that the information was wanted for the press, replied, The press? I'll have nothing to say to it. We are oppressed enough already. That a class numbering thirty thousand should be permitted to remain in a state of almost brutish ignorance is a national disgrace. If the London costers belong especially to the dangerous classes, the danger of such a body is assuredly an evil of our own creation, for the gratitude of the poor creatures to any one who seeks to give them the least knowledge is almost pathetic. Of the dress of the costermongers. From the homes of the costermongers we pass to a consideration of their dress. The costermongers' ordinary costume partakes of the durability of the warehouseman's, with the quaintness of that of the stable boy. A well to do coster, when dressed for the day's work, usually wears a small cloth cap, a little on one side. A close fitting worsted tie up skull cap is very fashionable just now among the class and ringlets at the temples are looked up to as the height of elegance. Hats they never wear, excepting on Sunday, on account of their baskets being frequently carried on their heads. Coats are seldom indulged in. Their waistcoats, which are of a broad-ribbed corduroy, with fustian back and sleeves, being made as long as a groom's, and buttoned up nearly to the throat. If the corduroy be of a light sandy colour, then plain brass or sporting buttons, with raised foxes or stags' heads upon them, or else black bone buttons with a flower pattern, ornament the front. But if the cord be of a dark rat-skin hue, then mother-of-pearl buttons are preferred. Two large pockets, sometimes four, with huge flaps or lapels like those in a shooting coat, are commonly worn. 
If the costermonger be driving a good trade, and have his set of regular customers, he will sport a blue cloth jacket, similar in cut to the cord ones above described. But this is looked upon as an extravagance of the highest order, for the slime and scales of the fish stick to the sleeves and shoulder of the garment, so as to spoil the appearance of it in a short time. The fashionable stuff for trousers, at the present, is a dark-coloured cable cord, and they are made to fit tightly at the knee, and swell gradually until they reach the boot, which they nearly cover. Velveteen is now seldom worn, and knee-breeches are quite out of date. Those who deal wholly in fish wear a blue serge apron, either hanging down or tucked up round their waist. The costermonger, however, prides himself most of all upon his neckerchief and boots. Men, women, boys, and girls all have a passion for these articles. The man who does not wear his silk neckerchief, his kingsman as it is called, is known to be in desperate circumstances, the inference being that it has gone to supply the morning stock money. A yellow flower on a green ground, or a red and blue pattern, is at present greatly in vogue. The women wear their kerchiefs tucked in under their gowns, and the men have theirs wrapped loosely round the neck, with the ends hanging over their waistcoats. Even if a costermonger has two or three silk handkerchiefs by him already, he seldom hesitates to buy another, when tempted with a bright, showy pattern hanging from a field-lane doorpost. The costermonger's love of a good, strong boot is a singular prejudice that runs throughout the whole class. From the father to the youngest child, all will be found well shod. So strong is their predilection in this respect, that a costermonger may be immediately known by a glance at his feet. He will part with everything rather than his boots, and to wear a pair of second-hand ones, or translators as they are called, is felt as a bitter degradation by them all. Among the men this pride has risen to such a pitch that many will have their upper leathers tastily ornamented, and it is not uncommon to see the younger men of this class with a heart or a thistle surrounded by a wreath of roses worked below the instep on their boots. The general costume of the women, or girls, is a black velveteen or straw bonnet, with a few ribbons or flowers, and almost always a net cap fitting closely to the cheek. The silk kingsman, covering their shoulders, is sometimes tucked into the neck of the printed cotton gown, and sometimes the ends are brought down outside to the apron strings. Silk dresses are never worn by them. They rather despise such articles. The petticoats are worn short, ending at the ankles, just high enough to show the hall of the much-admired boots. Coloured, or illustrated shirts, as they are called, are especially objected to by the men. On the Sunday, no costermonger will, if he can possibly avoid it, wheel a barrow. If a shilling be an especial object to him, he may, perhaps, take his shallow and head-basket as far as Chalk Farm, or some neighbouring resort, but even then he objects strongly to the Sunday trading. They leave this to the Jews and Irish, who are always willing to earn a penny, as they say. The prosperous coster will have his holiday on the Sunday, and if possible his Sunday suit as well, which usually consists of a rough beaver hat, brown petersome, with velvet facings of the same colour, and cloth trousers with stripes down the side. The women, generally, manage to keep by them a cotton gown of a bright showy pattern, and a new shawl. As one of the craft said to me, Costas likes to see their gals and wives look ladylike when they takes them out. Such of the costas as are not in a flourishing way of business, seldom make any alteration in their dress on the Sunday. There are but five tailors in London who make the garb proper to costermongers. One of these is considered somewhat slop, or, as a coster called him, a springer-up. This springer-up is blamed by some of the costermongers, who condemn him for employing women at reduced wages. A whole court of costermongers, I was assured, would withdraw their custom from a tradesman, if one of their body, who had influence among them, showed that the tradesman was unjust to his workpeople. The tailor in question issues bills after the following fashion. I give one verbatim, merely withholding the address for obvious reasons. Once try, you'll come again. Slap up Tog and out-and-out kisks his builder. Mr. Blank nabs the chance of putting his customers awake that he has just made his escape from Russia, not forgetting to clap his maulers upon some of the right sort of ducks to make single and double-backed slops for gentlemen in black, when, on his return home, he was stunned to find one of the top manufacturers of Manchester had cut his lucky and stepped off to the Swan Stream, leaving behind him a valuable stock of moleskins, cords, velveteens, plushes, swan-downs, etc., and I, having some ready in my kick, grabbed the chance and stepped home with my swag, and am now safe landed at my crib. I can turn out toggery of every description, very slap-up, at the following low prices for ready gilt, tick being no-go. Upper Benjamin's built on a downy plan, a monarch to half a finnuff. 
slap up velveteen togs, lined with the same, one pound one quarter and a peg. Moleskin, ditto, any colour, lined with the same, one cooter. A pair of Kersimir's kickses, any colour, built very slap up with the artful dodge, a canary. A pair of stout cord, ditto, built in the Melton Mowbray style, half a sov. A pair of very good broad cord, ditto, made very saucy, nine bob and a kick. A pair of long sleeve moleskin, all colours, built hanky spanky, with a double fakement down the side and artful buttons at the bottom, half a monarch. A pair of stout ditto, built very serious, nine times. A pair of out and out fancy sleeve kickses, cut to drop down on the trotters, two bulls. Waist togs, cut long with moleskin back and sleeves, ten peg. Blue cloth ditto, cut slap with pearl buttons, fourteen peg. Mud pipes, knee caps, and trotter cases, built very low. A decent allowance made to seedy swells, tea kettle purgers, head robbers, and flunkies out of collar. NB. Gentlemen finding their own brodie can be accommodated. End of excerpts concerning costermongers from London Labour and the London Poor by Henry Mayhew. Read by Jason Mills.